Good morning, church. It's beautiful, isn't it? The way God is moving among us, the commotion of the Holy Spirit in this place is amazing. And I'm very happy that, uh, not just because my mother-in-law is, is here, yeah? But also because you are doing your homework well, so you gave me plenty of time. I love it. Especially this morning, I'm feeling more Brazilian than British. Mm. How are you today? So, I think we believers, we Christians, we have to change or we need to change our attitude when, towards when we ask people, how are you today? So, I'm asking you, how are you today? But what I mean is, have you had enough food to eat this week? Have you have had enough money to buy your clothing to keep well? You know, have you actually spent some time with your wife and your husband, your children? This how are you today has to be seen in a much broader way. Otherwise, we are just kind of, how are you today? Oh, I don't care, really. <laughs> yeah? But it's actually what we mean. It's kind of we care for each other, you know? Uh, otherwise, we, we run the risk of uh, falling into what James said, you know? When somebody knocks on your door, uh, asking for something, you say, God bless you, go in peace. And what's, you know, is that all? And sometimes we do have the means to help people and we hold back and we think that a God bless you is all people need and probably not. It's more than that. But actually, my, our preaching for this morning is not, has nothing to do with this. <laughs> yeah? We are continuing uh, on the theme of um, false teachers and false apostles. And when Paul had this difficult task to deal with such a situation and such, such a difficult people as the Corinthians, they were not going through a very good time and it seemed to be that the whole uh, enterprise, the whole mission among the the Corinthians were kind of, uh, you know, uh, falling apart to a point that last time we, we discussed about Paul having to publicly, publicly defend his apostolic uh, authority, ministry given by God. And today we're going we're going to explore that Paul not just defended himself, but he uh, makes uh, the, the Corinthians aware of the dangers of the false apostles among them, the so-called super apostles. And I think this is a very relevant theme for us today, you know, because if you allow the, uh, the false teachings a kind, to, a kind of undermine, you know, our spiritual uh, experience with God, we are going to have trouble in our journey. So we have to become aware that the false teachings are there, the false apostles are there, and they do work their way into our lives in a very sneaky way. So we need to become aware of it. But let's, let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 1 to verse 15. Are you with me? Some of you are nodding off already. It's making, making me a little bit concerned. Never mind. Yeah. 
is Second Corinthians. If I can find, if if a, if a preacher cannot find Second Corinthians <laughs> in his Bible, no, I, I'm getting there because the, no, the <laughs> the pages of the Bible are very thin. I'm struggling here, but I know where it is. Don't worry. Yes, yeah, Second Corinthians, chapter eleven. Oh, I have marked here actually. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> Amen. Paul and the false apostles. I hope you you will put up with a little of my foolishness. Amen. <laughs> but you are already doing that. I am jealous for you with a good with a godly jealousy, I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present to you as a pure virgin to, to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we have preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you have accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But I don't think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. I may not be a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way, and I will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do, and I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want, who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. The end will be what the actions deserve. Lord, we again come before your presence and we continue to allow this commotion, this move of the Holy Spirit to find place in, in our minds and hearts. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to open widely our hearts and minds and, uh, and uh, receive this morning what you have in store for us. Would you please, Lord, continue to speak to us would you please reveal to us the wonders of your love and uh, your knowledge?
so we can grow in faith. Would you, Lord, to, would you comfort us and bring your peace and cast away any worries we have at the moment so our minds and souls are set free to listen to your sweet voice this morning is speaking to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I said before, the last time I was preaching here, Paul was a kind of defending his apostolic authority by affirming that actually the authority he had was given by God. This had implications in what uh, people would receive as being genuinely uh, coming from God. So it comes to a point that, you know, the Corinthians was a kind of cynical in terms of uh, what Paul was trying to say to him through his letters. And he kind of reestablished his apostolic authority by saying, I am the man. I am your man, you know. I am the person that actually... Uh, has the um, wisdom and knowledge of God and the one who went through all troubles and difficulties in life so you can grow in your faith. He was a kind of um, saying to, the, to uh, the Corinthians, listen, we apostles, we go through a hard time. Yeah? We become sometimes poor, so you become rich, and this needs to be honored. Uh, for the leaders of, uh, of, the, uh, of the cell groups, of connect groups, you're going to see that uh, you start your connect group by praying for those men and women of God called to be in the front line and give their lives up in order to build the kingdom of God. But this time, Paul talks about the dangers of the false apostles, of the teachings that they disseminated among the congregation. You know, if you want to shake up, shake up somebody's faith in the congregation, if you want to cause disunity, if you want to kind of... Uh, you know, uh, 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 destroy what God is doing, the easiest way to do so is by disseminating lies and false teachings. I have seen it myself. I have seen beautiful, powerful work, churches being destroyed, when I say destroyed, not by a bomb, but you know, falling apart because of false teachings. I have, I have uh, heard of churches that, uh, uh, you know, fell apart because they could not decide if you were, you know, to believe that we lose or do not lose our salvation. Well, they, this have a huge implication, but I won't go there this morning. It's quite complicated. And uh, Paul starts by saying, listen, uh, just bear with me with my foolishness. A way of saying, you know, probably the things I'm going to say to you, this more, uh, the, to say to you uh, uh, through these letters are the things that you don't believe in. Because actually, I come to you with a godly jealousy. How can somebody be godly jealous? But if you see the interpretation of these godly jealousies, it has to be with, with zeal. Zeal? Yes. Paul was very zealous of the work he had started. He was kind of uh, protective of those people, but in a good way. Just because he loved people. 
Paul loves was not about buildings, was not about, you know, uh, 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 material things. Paul was in the business of loving people, of relating to people, and the people are the most uh, precious asset that the church can ever have. You know, because sometimes we get, you know, into these colors and the, and the, how the chairs are comfy, should it be or not, or, and we forget that in Africa, you know, at this moment in time probably, there are thousands of people sitting on trunks of trees, worship God. Does it matter? No. Because what is important actually is people. And that was Paul concern. People. That people do well, develop you well in their journey with God. And here he brings in the picture of, uh, I, I'm trying to present to you as a pure virgin to Christ. He, he, he used this picture and he brings again the sense of, of, of a purity, of a church being pure, of a church sticking up to the principles she gets from the word of God. We're not talking, Paul is not concerned about the virginity of the institution, the purity of the institution, because there is no way of measuring it, if you know what I mean. But he's talking here about the purity of, um, of mind. The way we think. The way we open up our minds to receive what is good and sometimes what is bad. You know, our minds, our times have been, sometimes have been contaminated by things that we receive from outside. And when we think, brothers and sisters, that the false apostles are among us alone, we get it wrong because the false apostles, Nowadays, they come in any shape and form. They could be easily your TV sets, your mobile phone, your newspaper, your friends, even those who don't have any experience with God. And the purity of mind of being able to discern things that come from God from the things that don't come from God, is important, is relevant. We could not afford to open up our minds to anything. We live in a pl pluralistic society today, yeah? Everything is right. Depends, from, depends on your perspective, the way you look at it. And uh, we as a Christians, we are embarking in this thinking as well. Oh, it's fine, no problem. Everything's allowed. It's a modern society. We cannot keep ourselves from it. We watch TV programs that actually are completely, completely different from, from the Bible principles. And it seems that we're happy with it, you know. Oh, no problem. It's just a program. I'm challenging myself to switch off the TV every time I see, I watch something that is completely out of order when compared to the Word of God. I'm doing myself and I'm growing. So it's not a law. I would like to be a law, but it's not. So... You do as you feel from the Holy Spirit. But he, he has to do with the purity of principles. As I said to you, we negotiate sometimes our principles. And the, the, the false apostles love it. When the false apostles, you're going to know who they are in a bit. When the, 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 the false apostles, they see in us that we are people that negotiate our principles quite easily. They say, yeah! It's like winning for them the Euro million. That's actually the kind of ground they would say 
you know, I want to feed myself on. And I'm afraid sometimes we have negotiated our principles, what we believe in, so easily, and we are confused because the Bible seems to say something and uh, there are a host of people outside there interpreting the other way around. And what I'm calling, what I'm trying to portray this morning is we have to stand firm to what we have learned from the Word of God, the Word that generated life in us. And not be ashamed of it. He calls for purity of faith. The way we see God. We see God's kingdom. How do we see God's kingdom? You know, maybe some people are in God's kingdom for a ride. But God's kingdom is not just about rides. It's about also, you know, being able to be there in times of troubles, in times of difficulties, in times of disappointment, you know. And he, he keeps going. And then he takes us back to an event in the Garden of Eden. I don't know if you have this in the PowerPoint or not. I don't think so. But he, he says, remember Eve. I might read to eyes, uh, uh, let's see, no, no, uh, verse 3 he said, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, and I end up kind of um, or trying to think what happened to Eve, what kind of medication she was on that day. <laughs> you know, when she held this conversation with the serpent, illustration for the enemy. You know, I personally believe one of the things that worked against Eve was the fact that women like, like talking. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Hold on. D don't panic yet, Ruth. No, that's, that's a fact, isn't it? Yeah, it's a fact. Women like talking. That's the, the, the nature, there is nothing wrong with it. We men, we are more reserved. We like talking to, but we can see clearly. For example, if you are in an airport, a group of ladies, yeah, and one decides to go to the toilet, the other say, "Can you come with me to the toilet?" Yeah. <laughs> if I say that, let's say to Doctor Sun, Doctor Sun, can you come with me? To the <laughs> like talking, and. All we need to do is, husbands, is to listen to our wives. Yeah. Because they talk, and they like talk, and probably because of our absence in the relationship. I don't know where Adam was when Eva was having this conversation with the serpent, anyway. And we need to listen and I know I, I, I'm quite kind of um, getting stray of the, you know, the theme, but I have seen relationships breaking down because it was mentioned here before, because there is no talk, no communication in the relationship. And if the, if the wife, if you, we, women, they have the need, the need to talk, we have to be good listeners. That's it. And keep the communication flowing. Did I redeem myself now? But I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding about what I said, but what I, I want to say is, actually the reason Paul mentioned this was because there is a very important principle here. Why people are deceived by false apostles. 
because most of the time they want to get something out of it. Oh, if you listen to what I said, you are going to be a rich man. In this church, everybody is prosperous. If you become a believer, you are going to be very prosperous, in this sense, rich. Really? You mean I'm going to have my own house? My Ferrari? My Mercedes? Yes, that's the kind of Christianity I want. And you see, for Eve was a kind of, wow, I can see where this false apostle, the, the enemy, is taking me. So actually, if I do what you say, ah, I'll become, I'll have more knowledge than God. Wow, that is what I'm looking for. And in a sense, we are deceived by others. Because actually, the bottom line is, we want to benefit from something. And we have to be careful with that. The false preachings is always built around lies and deceptions related to three things. If you see verse 4, yep. See what it says in verse 4. For if someone comes to you and preaches... Okay, first, what? Preaches what? Ah? Come on. Preach that Jesus. Okay? Other than Jesus we preached. Or if you receive what? A different what? A spirit. And he goes on. Or a different what? Gospel. The false preachings are, most of the times, you know, built around the person of Jesus, the person of the Holy Spirit, and the gospel that is preached, or the kingdom of God. For example, related to the person of Jesus, they, the false teachers would say to you, oh, don't care about the poor and the lost, but he cares about, what he cares about is how to entertain us and make us richer. He may preach you a Jesus that actually is confined only to this church. And as, as I said before, Jesus is not really concerned about, you know, what is going on there. He's concerned about only what is going on here. But actually, Jesus is as much concerned what is going on there as much as what is going on here. And you know, and, and, and because the, the strategy behind the false apostles sometimes is I have to concentrate people not around the community, but I have need to concentrate people around myself. Because for the false apostles, it's all about themselves. It's not about Jesus. It's not about the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's all about themselves. They will promise to make... They will uh, try... Uh, since, yeah. They promise to try to make a sense and experiment the Holy Spirit in their ways. Yeah. They'll say to you... I'm trying to read my dodgy English here. Okay. They will try to say, you see, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit wants to take you to deeper experience. I'm just saying some of the things I have heard, not at this church, but along my ministry. They will say things like, you know, there are lots of uh, unknown experience about the Holy Spirit that I would love to introduce you to. And this, you know, experience with the Holy Spirit that goes beyond what the Bible says will make you a kind of, a, you know, jump up and down. You're going to be more sensitive to God. And they will say to you, because maybe you have not heard this in your church, 
Maybe George and, and, and Pastor Chris never said to you about these experiences with the Holy Spirit. But you know, God works in, in a mysterious way. I believe God works in a mysterious way, but God's not mysterious himself. And you have to be careful. And actually, what they try to teach you with, the, with these new experiences with the Holy Spirit actually is their own way. It's a way of, 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 of uh, creating a stronghold over your life. And before you know it, you are not more followers of Jesus, but followers of a specific person. The mark or the signs of the super apostles, as Paul coins the expression, are very clear. Let me tell you a story told by William Barclay. He says that a group of people, a group of men, were meeting over a dinner. And then they, have, uh, they had the idea of uh, each in individual there to recite something. And then a well-known actor said, I will recite Psalm 23rd. Do you know what Psalm it is? The Lord is my shepherd. And he used all his skills as a proper trained actor. He made it very dramatic, very professional. And you know, he sat down to a tremendous applause. Wow! The people really get, got excited about it. Then another man in the room <coughs> quietly said, oh, I'm going to recite the same psalm, Psalm 23rd. But he was a very quiet man, you know, and he bubbled you know, a few words and, and very shy, and no reaction from the people gathered, and he seated rather quietly, and no expression of joy from the people there. Then the actor leaned across the table and said to that man, you know, I know the Psalms, but you know the shepherd. The most important thing in life is knowing the shepherd. The super apostles, they come with the air of uh, competent people, very eloquent, not, not as me, trying to pass on to people that they know what they are doing and, you know, uh, kind of act. But what lacks is not just uh, our, it's not about our ability to communicate is how much we know God. That's what Paul said. You know, maybe a lack, a lack in communication, but you know, I have a good knowledge, knowledge of God. So the signs of, of, of the super apostles are this deceitfulness and the cunning talk. They'll talk in verse 6, They'll talk to you smoothly and try to make up your mind. They will use the Bible verse or the Bible in a very wrong way. Love for money, verse 7. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was in the business not because of money. I'm not doing what I'm, do, I'm doing because of money. <laughs> I'm doing it because of my sense of a call. Paul, 
genuine apostles, genuine minister. They are not concerned about the wool of the sheep. They are concerned about what? The sheep. And we love what we do because there are people involved in it. But the super apostles today on the TV, I don't want to be judgmental. They will talk, talk, but they'll never forget to ask you for some money in the end of the teaching. It's all to do with money. Thirdly, they desire to be in the spotlight. The false apostle will do anything that's possible to be in the spotlight. They don't delegate. They don't share. It's all about themselves. It's all about controlling. Controlling people's minds and hearts. And sometimes... I ask myself, are we being controlled by false apostles, not as we know it? Are we being controlled by the system? I wish some po- at some point we talk about the system we live in today. Are we being controlled by the system? Is the system dictating to us what we should believe in? how we should behave, how we should dress, how we should treat other people. Are we living under a system that slowly, you know, is killing our identity? Is a case to explore. Are the false apostles nowadays coming to us in the form of a people Or or are they coming as well in other forms? We have to ask this question. And lastly, the false apostles live a double life. Verse 13. They masquerade themselves sometimes as men and women of God. They will preach to you They will share the word of God with you wrongly. But they will not do what they preach. And if there is a need today in the kingdom of God is for not only preachers, but for Christians that live what they preach. You know what I mean? It's about living what we preach. Because we, ca- we can go to the market with uh, the Bible in our hands and, you know, make a good sermon out of it. And many people will, will be wowed. Wow, Ooh, he's a brilliant preacher. She's a brilliant preacher. But if next day they see you doing completely completely different from what you said the day before. There is no point. Now, people won't read the Bible, but they will read your life. You are the Bible for them. That puts a lot of weight upon our shoulders, doesn't it? We don't need to be perfect. I'm not talking about perfection here. I'm talking about living out simply and keeping the purity of thinking, okay? The purity of our faith, as the Bible tells us to do. And... uh, the false apostles, they live a double life. They will say something to you today and uh, something different tomorrow. They change their doctrine, their principles. This year they say something, next year is another thing, which is controversial. 
But to sum up this time, how do we face up to these false apostles in any shape or form they present to us? Hosea, is that Hosea? 4 6. Let's read together. Let's go. My people are destroyed from the lack of knowledge because you. Knowledge. I must please. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> but we suffer today because of the lack of knowledge. I'm not talking about knowledge that you got when you, you went to uni. I'm talking, and the Bible is talking about the knowledge of God that you can get from his own word. Do you know how do we face up to, to the false apostles? When we commit ourselves to the scripture, when we live by the scripture, when we understand that the scripture or the word of God has power to transform and change as daily, when this book is not a mere book that is placed in my bookshelf. Actually, there is a lady who had lost uh, her glasses for five years. And she said, well, well if she had, had, had been looking for her glasses for five years, you know, and he, she said, today I'm going to find my glasses. And when she, you know, went thoroughly, thoroughly uh, in the house looking for her glass, she found it within her Bible. So probably she was not reading the Bible for five years as well. Is your Bible accumulating dust? I think one of the tragedies in my life is when I sense I'm losing the law for the word of God. Wow, does it happen to ministers as well? I never knew that. Wow. Oh, they do. Because the easiest thing is for Christianity to become a routine in your lives. And when Christianity, God, and the Word of God is a routine, we are vulnerable to the cunnings of the false apostles. apostles. So love the Word of God. <coughs> Live by the Word of God. Stand by the Word of God. Allow yourselves to be transformed by the Word of God. Do not negotiate your principles, your faith, what you learned from the Word of God. Stick by what the Word of God says. Be transformed again by this Word. Find joy and rejoice for the fact that you are privileged people. We are privileged people as British because we are one of, of the few nations that have access to the Word of God. We have the Word of God translated to us. There are over 4,000 languages which don't have the Word of God translated yet. Or some of them have just parts of the Word of God translated. And here we go, we have the Word of God in our hands. This Word that has the power to transform us inside out and to transform the lives of others. And we don't bother sometimes. This morning, I call the church to recommit yourselves to the purity of mind, the purity of your faith, I 
call the church this morning to look beyond one man can offer, but on the contrary, to commit again yourself to Hebrews 12, 2, part A. Let us fix, let's, let's say it together. Let us fix our eyes in Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith. Hallelujah. It's not about fixing our eyes on one person, but on Jesus, because he will never let you down. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up and let's sing.